something happen. Oh yeah, this is the beginning. So my talk is entitled Calibration Substrate Design for Accurate Millimeter Wave Probe Tip Calibration. So this is what we usually have after the RF probes. And uh, this work is um, a joint work operation between uh, MPI and the Ferdinand Braun Institute for High Frequencies in Germany, FBH. Uh, my co-authors were Ralph Dorner and uh, Nock Pung. Uh, they are unfortunately not here with me, so I, I mm, have honor to present our work. And the uh, outline of my talk uh, consists of brief introduction of the problem and problem statements, investigation methods that we use to design the calibration substrate, criteria uh, that we were focused on. Uh, I will share with you some simulation results, also some measurement results, and wrap up with a few con uh, conclusion lines. Uh, talking about a prop tip calibration when we use a commercially available calibration substrate. Actually, motivation to start and motivation for our work uh, was really on the table. Uh, this slide gives us um, a very first commercially available calibration substrate manufactured by Tektronics all the way back to 1988-89, Tek 96. So, and what you can see here is that the shape of the calibration substrate and what you actually have on the calibration substrate as a set of planar reference structures didn't really change much over the last 30 years. We have a set of um, lumpet standard elements like open, short, and load, and throughs, and complainer wave got design. Uh, so the calibration, there is only difference is that the, uh, the substrate was made on sapphire. And uh, we need to keep in mind that the measurement frequencies at that time were limited uh, by the RF probes, uh, and that was roughly 18 gigahertz and belong. 30 years have passed, and uh, the way how we build calibration substrates today, and MPI, MPI is also one of the companies who provides the set of commercially available uh, calibration substrates, so didn't really change much. It's uh, almost the same thing. Uh, we moved uh, to a commercially available application, so we did the best to, engineers did the best to uh, minimize the cost of the test. So which means that we walk away of Sapphire and we implemented Alumina, which is uh, very, very reliable, pure Alumina, and uh, gives very good characteristics of Kaplan wave guideline, make it affordable to buy. Uh, however, uh, measurement frequencies drastically increase. It's almost 100 times higher. We measure today up to 1.5 terahertz at the wafer level. But this calibration substrate shares the same design concepts which is 30 years, uh, th 30 years ago. That was our motivation just to look at it and see if we can really do uh, our job better. And a very helpful uh, source of information for us was available. We are very happy uh, um, to have an access to outcome of European projects, Plan Arcal. Well, people sp uh, spent uh, three years. The project was led by, uh, by um, um, PTB, a standardization institute uh, from Germany. And the project outcome uh, were actually several documents. One of them is design guide, which helps you to understand uh, how you can do the job better uh, um, designing your coplanar calibration structures up to uh, frequencies up to 325 gigahertz. Well, we, based on recommendation of, uh, of this project, and uh, we uh, try to optimize the standard, uh, the uh, design of the calibration standards, and we use several uh, investigation methods. The first of all, of course, uh, before you build something, you need to simulate it. And uh, today's simulation tools are extremely powerful. We have very uh, powerful computers that we had an access to, and we could simulate. We built all our analysis using the system MicroWeb Studio, and uh, uh, we use a time domain solver for several reasons. One of them is that actually uh, the level of accuracy uh, we needed in our CAL required extremely fine meshing of all components. And we also uh, needed to uh, simulate the entire assembly of calibration substrates plus the props together. And have a little bit more information on the upcoming slides. So, and uh, for, data process, uh, for data processes, we use multi-line TRL uh, calibration algorithm. So our reference plane was set to the end of the uh, virtual probes, and then uh, we perform multi-line TRL and look at the electrical characteristics of couplana waveguide lines as, as devices. When we use uh, electromagnetic tool, there are several options you can choose from uh, how to, ins 
how to insert the signal into, um, into your device under test. A uh, pretty obvious one, simple to use, many people use it, it is a waveguide port, natural thing, we try it and uh, we decided not to use it for several reasons. Uh, reason number one is um, uh, actually, same reason we have a higher order modes, uh, specifically, uh, I will say injected by the way how the pro port is structured, so so-called bo uh, box modes that uh, we were not able to get rid of and uh, that's why uh, lower frequencies, this type of the port works pretty good, like analysis up to 40 gigahertz. If you need to go to frequencies beyond 110, it's not a bad idea. Uh, recent alternative reported by Ferdinand Brown Institute a couple of years ago is using the Lumpet port with an artificial uh, uh, ejection mechanism, kind of a bridge port. It actually works pretty well, and it gives you a very well-defined coplanar waveguide mode at a given cross-section of your coplanar waveguide uh, uh, element. However, yeah, it simulates the characteristic and helps you to understand the characteristics of the line. Only the line probe impact is not included, but we also wanted to uh, look at the probe added error as well. So that is why the most, uh, I would say, efficient way to uh, get results we needed uh, is when we used, and we used uh, an artificial model of the probe, which is close to the real microwave probes, and we needed to simulate the entire assembly probes plus calibration substrate itself and part of this chuck included, but this method is extremely resource hun hungry. Even, uh, even modern computers usually take, I would, say, I would say, a couple of days to get results out of one, uh, uh, one standard. Optimization criteria which we work on included uh, the ways to improve accuracy of the multi-line TRL. There were several publications that uh, we used and built our research on, uh, on how we can do a multi-line TRL better. Uh, we set up a target frequency for us, uh, well, everything beyond 110 was very good for us and 220 was kind of very good, nice, uh, sweet pot, uh, spot. Uh, we uh, used the methods described and, and recommended in plan our cal uh, when we optimized our standards. Uh, then uh, the calibration substrate also needed to support a lumpet uh, calibration scheme. So it needs to uh, also to have open shorts and loads because many people love uh, lumpet standard based um, calibration methods. The calibration substrate also needs to sit and rest on the uh, commercially available um, probe systems. So which is, is limited in the space that you have auxiliary sites uh, are typically small, so we cannot expand the calibration substrate for in size, which is always recommended if you want to uh, do better cal. And commercially affordable means that we need, still need to consider the number of elements we put on this calibration substrate. So designing uh, only one substrate for one cal set was not an option for us at all. Well, design goals uh, for, uh, for the cross-section of coplanar waveguide line, uh, the line needs to support the typical probes, the footprint uh, um, area, so uh, choosing something which is less than uh, 20 micron for the width of the signal line was not practical. Uh, single gap uh, should be actually wide enough, as wide as you can make, uh, because if you have wide signal gap, uh, you can minimize the impact of the manufacturing inaccuracy and uh, uh, get your characteristic impedance of the line more or less constant. Uh, uh, also, uh, ground, uh, grounds of the coplanar web get line should, have, uh, should be wide enough uh, because uh, for commercial reason, uh, we need to support uh, several uh, pitches of the, uh, of, of the RF probes. Uh, we also need to consider the entire uh, width of, um, of the line, and there is a very nice recommendation uh, in the Planar Cal uh, data. We please, uh, if you're interested, you can grab there. There's a graph practical uh, design you can build on. Uh, so, and the lines, of course, need to be 50 ohm. Uh, design outcome. Uh, we choose alumina calibration substrates, uh, epsilon effective 9.9. .9. Uh, substrate thickness uh, 250 uh, was very practical for us. Uh, we limited the, um, we end up with the limited number of probe pitch uh, supporting by this uh, calibration substrate, so from 50 to 100 micron. Uh, wider pitch is 125, 150 was a very good uh, idea, but we drop it because of um, some other, uh, well, it's not recommended actually for higher frequencies. Well, we also got rid of the wings. Uh, usually uh, people add uh, resistive material on the end of the grounds uh, for several reasons. Uh, we found out is that um, it's probably not a very good idea to use the wings at the higher frequencies. 
and specifically when we want to uh, build an analytical model of the transmission line and look into the uh, traceability uh, questions. It's always good to have a line which is purely uh, complainer waveguide design without additional link, uh, uh, wings. We look at if we could do um, an optimization for the length of transmission lines and we were able to use the same uh, number of lines as a normal calibration substrate design for the lower frequency. This, however, uh, find optimum uh, relationship between the line length and improve, uh, I would say, quality of the multi-line TRL, which is typically represented by so-called standard deviation. Uh, important thing is where you locate your calibration standards. Uh, planar Cal guidelines uh, suggests not to put transmission line close to the edge of the calibration substrate. So we really need to, we started with the multi-line TRL approach and we put uh, a set of transmission line directly in the middle of the calibration substrate to have a homogeneous environment ar around our transmission line, uh, lines and minimize the possible interaction with the neighborhood elements. Also, an uh, interesting thing is uh, we consider uh, bringing the lines off the grid, of the vertical grids where the lumpet element, uh, elements typically located. It also helped us to minimize the impact uh, of the parasitic complex of RF probes with the neighborhood elements and also impact of uh, um, lumpet standard elements when they use for the calibration. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, what we also look at is the distances. Distances from standard to standard and distance from standard to the edge of the calibration substrate. They become important at the higher frequencies and I have a, a, a graph to show you why. Actually, the wider you can do, the better. But keep in mind that you're limited in the size and the area of your calibration substrate which rests on the, uh, on the auxiliary side. So you cannot expand your calibration substrate uh, in the width and, uh, and the height. Uh, so you need to find an optimal hotspot uh, what is the optimum distance to the edge and what is the optimum distance from standard to standard in the columns and the rows. And uh, we improve these three parameters uh, for some of the access actually drastically versus uh, available calibration substrates. So the standards are simply wider from each other and we have uh, um, larger margins uh, close to the edge. Simulation results, they are really interesting. So this graph shows us two references that we use for us to analyze our outcome. Uh, one of them is a commercially available calibration substrate from MPI, which was designed to serve uh, calibration needs up to 110 gigahertz. This is AC2. Then we also looked at the commercially available um, G-band calibration substrate. This is on the middle. Um, and uh, uh, we looked at our calibration substrate, uh, the new calibration substrate. So simulating all the standards, and we, uh, our method here was to look at the field distribution uh, this is the cross section at the, the, at the plane of the ceramic. And we look at the coupling with the neighborhood elements and uh, also with the uh, possible reflections at the, uh, from the edges of the calibration substrate. Uh, all these graphs are on the same, same scale. Uh, so the same resolution, color resolution is the same, and this is 110 gigahertz uh, frequency. What you can see here is that uh, the first reference for us is probably hitting its, I would say, application area. Uh, the, the form of the, uh, of the fields here look already corrupted, and uh, we see the strong interaction with the edge of the calibration substrate. So while uh, these two uh, calibration substrates uh, show more homogeneous picture uh, at 110 gigahertz. And by the way, this is the worst case scenario. Uh, the longest line, we have a worst case scenario. All other standards are much, much better. I'm just showing you extremes here. When we increase the simulation up to 220 gigahertz, uh, we were able to see that by increasing the distance to the edge of the calibration substrate and increasing the distance to the neighborhood elements, we were able to get the structure of the electromagnetic fields, I would say, more homogeneous. There's some improvement at 220 gigahertz. Uh, there was a previously work published at European Microwave Conference when the group from Ferdinand Brown Institute and PTB looked at the location-dependent calibration. What does it mean? You perform your multi-line TRL and you use the through standard, which is located, say, in the middle of the calibration substrate. And with respect of this calibration, you measure neighborhood through elements and see if you have exactly the same results. And the group published actually significant deviation, which was a big surprise. 
And uh, so which means that equivalent characteristics of the standards become also uh, location dependent at the frequencies above 140 gigahertz. We look at this phenomena as well. Uh, what we did is we use the same calibration substrate, run the simulation, and we look at the maximum error when we do multi-line TRL with the reference line, and we looked at other S parameters corrected with respect of this multi-line TRL, uh, all other throughs. I am showing uh, here only, I would say, uh, kind of extreme characteristics. Neighborhood, which is really close to the calibration through, has a minimum error. Then we move a little bit far from the reference, error increases, and right at the edge we have a maximum error. Once we saw these results, uh, we were not really confident if this is really, if we can take it uh, into consideration as a considerable error, uh, because every time when you do the electromagnetic simulation, the, uh, the tool, software tool, provides the meshing and does the meshing optimization by itself. So the question is that how repeatable are your data? So can, if you do the two, uh, two times simulation, will, will you see the same results? Or maybe the offset will be totally different. And what we did is what uh, engineers used uh, already on the practical measurement area, uh, a sort of calibration comparison technique. We looked at the reproducibility of our simulation uh, simulations, which means that we use the two simulation uh, setups, so two servers. On all these two servers, we run the se same set of the multi-line TRL structures. And uh, uh, one of the server results we use as a reference, another uh, results we use as a test calibration, uh, calibration method, and using calibration comparison technique, we calculated maximal possible error, which is actually we define as the reproducibility of our simulation tool. And it gave us a threshold for comparing any results. The same graph which shows us this, uh, this threshold uh, error. This is on the right hand side, and what you see is the reproducibility of our results is, an, uh, an, I would say, 100 times higher, uh, or oh, reproducibility error is 100 times lower than uh, the phenomena we observed here. So, which means that these deviations are actually noticeable. And we did the ex uh, same experiment also for, uh, for the proposed design of the calibration substrate. And uh, we, saw, uh, we were able to prove that uh, the location-dependent CAL was minimized almost like five times. Measurement experiment. We used two measurement setups equipped with two sets of different probes of different, uh, different geometries uh, and different vendors. Both of them were 110 gigahertz uh, capable. We used the same test sample and measured it on two just to be able to reproduce the measurement results. We use multi-line TRL and we extracted propagation constant of these lines and look at the purity of the uh, propagation constant. And we also measure uh, characteristic impedance using the lumbar load method introduced by NIST uh, many years ago. So here's a result of the same uh, propagation constant measured for the same lines uh, out of these two experiments, uh, test setup one and test setup two up to 110 gigahertz. We see that the uh, results lay on top of each other. That was a very good uh, feedback from Russ. Also in one of the setups we measure 110 gigahertz uh, reference calibration substrate AC2. And what we saw is that uh, roughly um, from 70 gigahertz uh, alpha, so uh, the loss of the uh, loss of coplanar waveguide line increases, and uh, we have a very good understanding why it is so. It's an imp impact of the ground wings uh, which are available on this substrate, and then uh, we also compare our measured results with the simulated results for transmission lines. Is a propagation constant, so loss dB per centimeter, which we simulated for this calibration substrate using the bridge ports. So it's a probe independent. Uh, results, just the pure characteristic uh, of, uh, of the transmission line, and a kind of a very good agreement with the practical uh, data that we acquired. And uh, this one, last slide, which shows also uh, you know, the extraction parameters, uh, results of uh, measurement of characteristic impedance of the line, real part and imaginary part, we were happy to see it that uh, actually we met our target, which was 50 ohm, we are very close, so at least the sample that we used for the measurements uh, met our requirements. That brings me to the last slide of my talk. As a conclusion, is that we uh, introduced the calibration substrate design, uh, which was built uh, 
on uh, recommendations for planar cal. Uh, for our understanding, this is probably the first time uh, when these recommendations are implemented into a commercially available calibration substrates. Uh, we targeted uh, commercial applications, so we need to do some shortcuts and some uh, assumptions here, like bringing more elements, not just only one, but uh, it's still acceptable. Um, we improve uh, characteristics of complainer, uh, complainer, uh, complainer web guide structures embedded on this uh, calibration uh, substrate, which uh, makes us more confident in the results of multi-line TRL cal. Uh, uh, the design that we use for complainer web guide structures supports also analytical description. Uh, so the next step and next next step would be uh, to look into the uh, traceability and metrology analysis of these transmission lines. And actually, uh, the first results uh, showed us that it's relatively, it looks, the substrate looks uh, promising for the applications at G-band. Thank you very much. We have a lot of optimization parameters. We could choose, for instance, different dielectrica. We could also choose, yeah, we could, we could make the signal line. So that is, yeah, we, we can also uh, choose from different processes, the thickness, like uh, sometimes you use a three micron process, sometimes you have five micron process, right? a lot of variations. So we try to get the one which gives us the wider gap. For a fixed process, for fixed electric, yes, correct. So what's the date when the, uh, that was? Because I've got a data share, it's a 1989, so eight of Good comment. Thank you. Yeah.